Luther had been called to trial and he arrived in Worms on the 15th of April, 1521, and he caused quite a stir. People were dying to see him and his place of residence was constantly full of people who wanted to spend a few moments with this brave man who was willing to take on the whole church all on his own. Luther's very appearance was a victory in itself for to be condemned and excommunicated and then be given a voice in trial undermines the authority of the one who excommunicated him. It must be noted that Luther at this stage of his life and ministry still had no intention of breaking away from the church. He commented that nothing could be gained through schism and he hoped to reform the church from within. One of the key principles of the Reformation that Luther accepted and held on to resolutely was that the Bible was the foundation of all Christian belief and practice. Thus, when accused of error and heresy, he simply asked his accusers to show him from the Bible where his error was. As he was about to enter the room, a few people spoke words of encouragement to him, in particular one army general who told him that he was about to make a more noble stand than he and any of his captains had made on the battlefield. He told them that if his cause was just, and he was sure of it, to go forward in the fear of God. At the trial, Luther was asked two things. Firstly, were the books his? And secondly, whether he would retract his opinions? Luther responded and said that the books were his, but he asked for some time in order to craft his response as to whether he would retract or not. This convinced the assembly that he was not acting from impulse and would later give further weight to his answers. The next day when Luther responded, he divided his writings into three different sections. In the first section, he dealt with faith and works, and even his enemies declared that these were not only harmless, but also beneficial. In the second class of books, he denounced the corruptions of the papacy, and to revoke these would strengthen the tyranny of Rome. And in the third class of books, he denounced those who defended these very evils. While Luther admitted that perhaps he could have been a little bit less harsh in his responses, even these he was not willing to retract. At this point, Luther had spoke only in German, and he was now asked to give his response in Latin. Despite being tired, he was able to do this, and it gave further weight to his response as everyone in the chamber heard what he said for the second time. The spokesman now pushed him for an answer, asking him the question, will you or will you not retract? Standing here on this very spot, Luther gave a response that has become famous over the centuries. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, for I cannot accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have often contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so God help me, amen. The assembly stood in amazement, speechless at what they had just seen and heard. He was again asked if he would retract, to which he responded, may God be my helper, for I can retract nothing. The courage that Luther spoke with at this trial has inspired many people since then to stand for God in the face of opposition and against the odds. In Mark 13 verse 9, the Bible tells us that one day we may have to stand before kings and rulers. May we be faithful to God that if we have to stand, we would do so with boldness and unflinching courage in the face of trial.
Following the Diet of Worms, Luther was still under a lot of pressure to recant and compromise in his positions with Rome. He was even threatened with banishment, but he would not be moved. He even said he would give up assurance of a safe conduct, but never his positions on the word of God. As Luther left Worms and traveled across the country, he was warmly received by the German people. But there were still many people who wanted to kill Luther, and the emperor himself said that as soon as the assurance of his safe conduct should expire, that measures should be taken to end Luther's work. The elector of Saxony, Frederick, devised a plan with some of Luther's friends to capture him and keep him hidden for some time. He was taken here to Wartburg Castle, a place kept so secret that even the elector Frederick did not know that he was being kept here. Luther's enemies rejoiced, thinking that he had been defeated, but this time for Luther would prove to be a double blessing. Not only did it withdraw him from the heat of the battle, but it also took him away from the public praise and adulation, something that can spiritually maim even the strongest of men. It was here in this room that Luther stayed during his time here at the castle. Like the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation as a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos, while Luther was hiding here in this castle, he translated into German the New Testament. He would translate the Old Testament later, after his return to Wittenberg. Another challenge to the Reformation would now appear on the horizon. In Luther's absence, other reformers had arisen whose message was different to that of Luther, and it was drawing away a lot of people and dividing the movement. In particular, some people thought that it was acceptable to use violence as a means to abolish the mass and to rise up against the oppressors. Thomas Munzer was a leader of this movement. This news was relayed to Luther and he felt a deep burden for his people back in Wittenberg as he thought of them as a shepherd thinks of their sheep. Despite having no assurance of a safe conduct, he left Wartburg Castle and headed for Wittenberg. Luther's return caused a great stir and the church filled at the first opportunity to hear him speak. Luther stood up and reaffirmed that the mass was a bad thing and ought to be abolished, but that no one should be torn from it by force. It was not their job to force the conscience of anyone, no matter how strong they felt about the matter. Luther was able to check this uprising for a while, but it would arise later on with devastating results when Thomas Munzer himself was killed. Every time there is a true revival, Satan brings a false one along. Even so, at the end of time, there's going to be a true revival of godliness, and then there's going to be a false revival as well. May we be faithful to God that we will be part of the true revival that will take place at the end of time. In 1529, the Second Diet of Spires convened right here. The first was in 1526, which gave each state full liberty in religious affairs. In 1529, all the German princes gathered here, along with representatives of the church. The church's desire was to crush out the heresy of the Reformation, first by peaceable means, but using full force if needed. One thing that was proposed was a halt on conversions. The states that sided with the Reformation would stay that way, and the ones that did not would stay as they were. If this edict was to be enforced, then the Reformation could not be extended where it was not yet known. Neither could it be established on a solid foundation where it had started. The key issue at stake was liberty of conscience. As they met to discuss what they would do with this proposal, key issues for the world lay on the table. Did Rome have the right to coerce conscience and forbid free inquiry? Music 
as they looked back at the recent history and saw the great sacrifice that many had made to get to this point. And they contrasted this with the major restriction on civil liberties that was proposed. The princes said, let us reject this decree. In matters of conscience, the majority has no power. They saw the state's role was to protect liberty of conscience and that this was also the limit of its role in religious matters. In their response, they used the word protest. And it's from here where we get the term Protestantism today. But it's important for us to understand the background of that term to know what a Protestant truly is. They said that the principles contained in this protest contained the essence of Protestantism. They opposed the abuse of man in two areas of faith. Firstly, the intrusion of the civil magistrate, and secondly, the arbitrary authority of the church. Instead of this, Protestantism puts the power of the conscience above the civil magistrate and the authority of God's word over the visible church. They rejected civil power in divine things, encouraging people, as in the book of Acts, to obey God rather than man. They understood that it was the role of the state to protect civil liberties and not to prescribe religious actions to the masses. In our day and age, there is a wide departure from this great Protestant principle the Bible and the Bible only as the rule of faith and duty. There is a need for us to have the same unswerving adherence to the Word of God as was manifested at this crisis of the Reformation. Had these princes buckled under pressure and sought to enjoy the success they had achieved thus far in order to secure favor with the authorities, the movement would have been destroyed. They understood that there were greater issues at hand and believers around the world since that time have enjoyed the benefits of their resolute stand. While the name of Martin Luther is well known throughout the world and the name of these princes is much less known, their place in history is nonetheless vital. May we truly understand what it means to be a Protestant, the authority of God's word and the power of the conscience in religious matters. John Calvin was born in Neon near Paris on the 10th of July, 1509. He was thus only a child of eight years old when Martin Luther, a man of 34 years old, nailed his famous 95 Theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. Calvin did not experience the harsh upbringing that Luther had, but had a happy start to life, enjoying every prospect of success and numerous educational advantages. At the age of 12, he was appointed to a chaplaincy in a church in his hometown. His head was shaved and he received a tonsure. As he grew up, he wanted to become a priest and was soon noted for his intellectual ability, his blameless life and his religious devotion. It was confidently anticipated that he would grow up to become a great defender of the Catholic Church. Calvin had heard of the new doctrines with a shudder not doubting at all that those who believed them, the heretics, were worthy and deserving of the fires to which they were often taken. At the age of 14, a plague hit the town where Calvin was living, and so he moved from his town here to Paris and studied at the University of Paris. An interesting coincidence took place whereby one of his fellow pupils was a boy by the name of Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola would grow up to found the Jesuits, a movement very, very different from the one that Calvin would lead later in his life. 
Two pupils, both outstanding, but who would both have a vastly different impact on the world. Calvin later on left studying for the priesthood and went to study law after his father's footsteps and after his wishes as well. He completed his doctorate in law at the University of Orleans, but after the death of his father, he would reevaluate his course and direction in life. Calvin's cousin had joined with the reformers, and whilst in public when speaking with him, Calvin would strongly defend the positions of the church and reject new teachings. When he was alone, he would ponder the words. Conviction of sin gripped him. He saw himself without an intercessor. Confession and penance were resorted to in vain, but none could bring about peace. One day he decided to visit a public square and he witnessed the burning of a martyr. He was filled with wonder at the expression of peace that was on his face and he contrasted this with his own feelings of emptiness, doubt and darkness. He knew that the martyrs rested their faith on God's word and so he proposed that he would study the Bible to see if he could find the secret of their joy. As he studied the Bible, he found Jesus Christ. No one knows for sure when Calvin experienced conversion, but that he did is not open to question. His conversion was definite enough to cause him to relinquish all income from church sources and abandon any idea of entering the legal profession. This decision would have been costly, causing him to give up an immense salary and all comforts that he was accustomed to in life. Calvin joined a small band of Protestants and preached the gospel from home to home for two years. The authorities were determined to capture him and kill him, and they came to his place of abode. But due to the quick thinking of some of his friends, they detained the officers at the door for long enough to allow others to lower him out of the window, and he was able to flee the city. One thing that we learned from the life of Calvin is that no matter what you start out doing in life, it doesn't have to be that way for the rest of your life. He started out wanting to be a priest. His father wanted him to be a lawyer. He ended up doing neither of these things and would go on to be a great reformer who changed the face of the whole of Christendom. Maybe you're in a course of study that you don't really enjoy or know why you're there. Maybe you're doing something that your parents have imposed upon you and that you don't really feel is your calling. And God may be calling you to something different. And I want to appeal to you that if that is the case, then follow the leading of the Lord. You may have to change your course of study. You may have to change your occupation. But when you do that, that's when true satisfaction, purpose and meaning comes in our lives. Reformation in the 16th century was not a smooth sailing. There was strong tension and conflict between the Protestants and Catholics, and in the latter part of the century, there were several wars between the two. In the 1530s, there was growing frustration as they saw their dream being fulfilled elsewhere in Germany and Switzerland, and yet in France, they were lagging behind. In order to advance their cause, it was thought they needed to strike a bold blow to Rome and attack one of the most controversial topics, the Mass. A tract was written. Many believe that Farrell wrote it in Switzerland, though others say that Antoine de Marcourt wrote it. The tract was entitled, True Articles on the Horrible, Great and Intolerable Abuses of the Popish Mass, invented in direct opposition to the Holy Supper of our Lord and only mediator and savior. The leaders of the French movement met to discuss how to use it and some felt it was too strong and direct and that to use it would cause more harm than good. Others thought that it was okay and when it was taken to a vote, it was decided to use it. 
They were distributed all over France, to every city, town, and even villages. And it was decided that on October the 24th, 1534, at night, they would be posted all over France. However, instead of advancing the Reformation, this zealous and ultimately ill-judged action brought ruin not only on those who had posted the placards, but on the reform or Protestant faith throughout France. One of the placards was posted on the king's personal chamber, and in his rage he said, let all be seized without distinction who are suspected of heresy, and I will exterminate all. The leaders of the Roman church had what they had longed for, a reason to wipe out the Protestants. Some poor adherent of the reformed faith were seized and commanded to show the papers all the homes of the believers in Paris. And under the threat of death, he cowardly went along and betrayed his people. They walked through the streets of Paris and grabbed people from their homes, imprisoning them before trying, torturing, and killing them. Hundreds of people fled Paris, people from all ranks of life. University professors, princes, artisans, and the Catholic Church was surprised to find how many Protestants had been living in Paris unknown to themselves. The leading French reformers would have to leave, finding refuge in Geneva, Switzerland, and it was from there that they would send pastors back into France so that in the space of 40 years, there were perhaps two million Huguenot Protestants and 1,250 churches throughout France. Saint Bartholomew's massacre would deal another blow to the church in France, and again, many people would leave France. At this persecution and subsequent ones that would follow, each time France would lose their skilled tradesmen and craftsmen suffering a brain drain that they had caused on themselves. The Swiss watchmaking industry was built largely by French Huguenot Protestants who fled there. One thing that we learned from this episode of history is that it's as important that we know when to say something and how to say something as it is that we say the right thing. Simply speaking the truth is not enough. The placards that were posted might have contained the truth about the mass and correctly pointed out the erroneous beliefs, but the way in which it was done was ill-judged and caused more harm than good. May we be wise in how we share the truth of God's word, sensitive to what others believe and always aim to be winsome in our methods and our words. After having to leave France, Farrell and Calvin moved and worked elsewhere. Farrell came here to the Geneva area and he had success in the villages and hamlets that surrounded the town of Geneva. But when he came into the city, he was initially rejected and had to leave the city. Another man who tried the work of reform here was a schoolmaster by the name of Froman and he had some success. Calvin also found his way to the city, though not by design. There was a road blockage because an army was in the road and he had to divert and he came through Geneva. He was planning to just pass through, but the believers here implored him to stay and assist the work of reform. And though initially reluctant, he eventually decided to stay. For nearly 30 years, he labored here in Geneva, firstly establishing a church that adhered to the morality of the Bible, and then for the advancement of the Reformation throughout Europe. His life as a public leader was not faultless. 
nor were his doctrines free from error, but he was instrumental in advancing truths that were of special importance and maintaining the principles of Protestantism against the errors of Rome. Sometimes you can learn a lot about someone by what their enemies say about them at their death. Pope Pius IV said of John Calvin, the strength of that heretic Calvin consisted in this, that money never had the slightest charm for him. If I had such servants, my dominion would extend from sea to sea. Calvin was a compulsive type A personality. He never wasted a minute. He preached five sermons a week, and he wrote a Bible commentary on virtually every book of the Bible. He also wrote countless theological articles on a wide variety of topics. He was not lazy. Even when he was on his deathbed, his friends urged him to refrain from his labor. He replied, what? Should the Lord come and find me idle? He lived a very modest life as well. He wasn't paid a large salary, but by the utmost frugality, he was able to save three years annual salary that he left to his heirs when he passed away. From Calvin's life, we learn He's a man who sent missionaries throughout Europe. He's a man who wrote books and sent them throughout Europe. He's a man that had an influence far more wider reaching than just his church. But really he started off just as the pastor of a church in Geneva. From small beginnings, he had a great, great influence. In Luke 16 verse 10, the Bible tells us, he that is faithful in that which is least will be faithful also in that which is much. May we be faithful wherever God has placed us, in whatever small place or small thing it is, that we may be faithful should God give us greater responsibilities or a greater sphere of influence.